My name is Vahid Chitsas, part of Elite Mastermind Group. Thank you for being here. Go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Absolutely. I am Letitia Action Jackson. I am a globally recognized women's personal development expert, 13-time author, fitness Olympian, and CEO of Empower Coaching Academy. And I'm here today from the sunny California. Awesome. Awesome. Let's dive into it. Yes. What does it mean when people say they want to go through self-development? Because I feel like it's a word that we throw out there very loosely. So I want to get your definition. What does it mean for someone to go through self-development? That's a really good question. I believe that the, the concept of self-development is individual. And, and that's a very, to me, a very sticky space where when we say self-development, we make it very narrow. Self-development is very broad. So my concept of self-development may be different from yours. Therefore, I would say there is not one true definition of self-development. It depends on that individual. Where do they want to see themselves? And where do they currently find themselves now? And what are the skill sets that they need or mindset shifts that will need to happen to get them to where they want to go? So personal development is individual. So, okay, so let's, I, so would you consider someone have gone through self-development just because we see changes? I think change is inevitable. I think evolution is intentional. So if, if someone has gone through changes, we have to ask ourselves, are they or have they gone through changes based on circumstances, i.e. did a person lose their job and because of that they had to go to another job? Was that a change? Yes, but was it self-development? That's not factual. So self-development is intentional. How do I start on that journey? You have to recognize that there's something you're displeased with. You have to recognize that there's something that within you, say for instance, I come from a long background of health and fitness. We have a thing called the trans-theoretical model of change. We know that change is a non-linear process, meaning a person does not just wake up one morning and say that they want to change. Change begins with an acknowledgement that there's a problem. And so in order for a person to create self-development, they have to acknowledge that there's something wrong or there's something that they're dissatisfied with. Yes, think about this. How do you change something that you don't acknowledge that there's a problem? How do you change something that you're not dissatisfied with? I'll give you an example. Well, I'm dissatisfied with traffic. Okay, so here's, here's hey, good, good example. If you're dissatisfied with traffic, then you can ask yourself, am I dissatisfied with traffic because of the rush of traffic? If you say yes, then you leave earlier. If, if you're dissatisfied with traffic, then you ask yourself, what is another route that I can go? It begins with a dissatisfaction, and then we begin to create the solution for that. Okay, so here is, we have, we have to make a very big distinction. So what's the difference between ambition and dissatisfaction? Because what I understood was ambition means that you want more. Dissatisfaction right. means that there is a lack or something you don't like. It doesn't mean you're crying. It doesn't mean you're crying. Mm -hmm. You just know that there could be more. Right. So... Would, would, would be, yeah. So if someone is looking for self-development, can we say they're dissatisfied or we should say they're ambitious? I think that it's not, just because someone desires self-development does not mean that it's only based on dissatisfaction. It could be an interest to learn more. I'll give an example. I have a dual master's in public health. Just because I have a dual master's in public health does not mean that I'm satisfied with only knowing what I know. I have a hunger and a desire to learn more. And it's not to say that I'm dissatisfied, but I know that I set new goals for myself. And in order to attain those, I must acquire new skill sets. So irregardless whether it's wanting to learn more or wanting to acquire more, it all starts with an acknowledgement of where we're at in this current moment and what are our desires. And that's where it's individualistic. You may have the perfect career. You may have the perfect home life on your terms. But you say to yourself, I want to become a better husband. I want to become a better entrepreneur. That understanding of that desire will cause you to go seek more knowledge on how to attain that. It's individualistic. 
Yeah, that part, the first part, the, the, the better husband. My wife has a very high standard, so I may never achieve that. Yeah. So I'm going to go for a better entrepreneur <laughs> because we can measure that. We can measure that. And my competitors may not be as hard as my wife on me. So you know what? I take my chances over there. Yes, yes, I love it. I love it. And also, I think even in that realm, you have to ask yourself, what is a good husband defining to you? And that's where it goes back to a personal understanding. To me, being fit means having endurance, having flexibility. To someone else being fit, maybe losing five pounds. It has to be an individualized experience. So here's my question. How do, do, how do we get individuals? Because in Alcohol Anonymous, mm -hmm. I love the first step and I like the last step. The first step is you got to recognize there is a problem. You have some type, you want to call it a disease, challenge, issue, whatever you want to call it. It's something that's making you do that, and we want to shift those bad habits out of the way. And obviously, the 13th step is you got to help somebody else. But how do we get people, because what you just said is simple, but when you think about it, it's very hard for us to do. Because if it was that simple that we could do, we want to have a lot of the challenges that we're having in our in our society today. Mm -hmm. If we could just have to just recognize that we want to change. So here here's the reality, and here is where life is hard for many of us. One of the things that I learned through coaching through my own business, I've worked for the United States Navy. I've worked in different sectors where I have been in some capacity of a leader or a coach, and I will tell you that this is a fact until an individual, however they come to this awareness, until they themselves come to an awareness that they desire a change, you can have the best um, drug prevention program, you can have the best chronic disease prevention program, and so people make a decision on themselves. We are assistants in helping people arrive at that choice, but we can't force change. And that's the danger about alcohol abuse, drug abuse, not only are you dealing with a chemical um, addiction, you're also dealing with someone that has been, their mind has been altered until they can see themselves, whether that's in a state of sobriety for two or three days. And they say to myself, I cannot live like this anymore. Family can say, hey, you need to go to rehab. Friends can say, hey, you need to go to rehab. Change has to start from within. We can evoke that process. Just like I'll go back to weight loss. I can write you the best weight loss program. But I can't every day say, hey, Vlad, you've got to eat healthy. You've got to get up and exercise. You've got to get to sleep. You've got to meditate. It has to be something that's within yourself where you say, I am uncomfortable with my back aching. I'm uncomfortable with being winded. Change has to be evoked by something inside of you. And that's really the problem we have in America. We want to be motivated. We want people to tell us what to do. January 1st is the perfect example. Around January 1st, let's be honest, people flood the gym and they're like New Year's resolution, New Year's resolution because commercial- But you can't blame them for, for having that though. I don't look at it as a downside though. I don't look at it that, oh no, they shouldn't do that. I'm saying let them come in J January 1st, but the trainers need to do a better job to hold them in there somehow, some way. Listen, I, I just don't want to leave it up to the person to make that decision. So like, stop right there. I show up to the gym, but enable me to stay there and be committed. So I'm, I'm looking for that solution. I, and that is the problem. Let's stay there. Let's stay there. Think about this. If, if, <laughs> if I say to you, Vlad, dinner is ready. I put a plate of healthy food in front of you. You sit to the table and you say to me, feed me. Is it my responsibility to feed you the food? No, I cooked it for you. I prepared it for you. You're a tough trainer. You're a tough trainer. I, I have to one tell tough you, trainer. I will have You're to a tough you. trainer. I am. And I will tell you, um, when I made it to the Olympia, eight months before I made it there, I had almost lost my life in a domestic violence attack. I was depressed. I had anxiety. I had suicidal thoughts. I realized after three months of, of being depressed and having these emotions, irregardless of how many times I spoke with family or reached out for people to motivate and to inspire me, something deep within me said, I've had enough of this. 
I went back to the gym. I used exercise as a way to help me overcome depression, anxiety. I got into the best shape of my life. I showed up at the gym every morning at 5.30, not because someone stood over me and said, hey, get to the gym. I woke up every morning at 5.30. I said, because I have to beat this. I have to overcome this. And we have done a very disservice with American people when we tell them, you know, find a motivational speaker, find someone that motivates you. That's not sustainable. Motivation. No, no, motivation gets you started. Habits keeps you going. So I'm a big believer. Listen, sometimes I, even though I have very good discipline in mm -hmm. some areas of my life, in some areas I don't, and I need to be motivated, and then I build that habit and keep it going. So, so let I, me ask you I, this. I know motivation is not all of it. Let me ask you this, though. I challenge you. Do you need to be motivated, or do you need to be guided to the process of being committed? Because I'm going to tell you, motivation is almost like, think about this. They say people that use drugs, the very first time that they get that high, they will never sustain that high again. It is unsustainable. Motivation is unsustainable. I can motivate you every day. Come on, you can do this, you can do this. But when I walk away from you, there has to be an internal dialogue within yourself. And that's what I teach my clients. And I, I, I am a hard coach because I've lived through a lot of hard things that have taught me motivation will open the door, but commitment keeps it open. Listen, if at any time you want to change your mind about being a coach, let me be one of your mentees. And then going through me, you'll change your mind about coaching. Really? Coach I, yeah. I don't know. I will have to tell you my track record. Oh, my gosh. I, man, I have Listen, don't challenge me. I'm in L.A. Don't challenge I'm me. I'm in you. L.A. too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love just it. I watch love out. It. Don't commit to anything without knowing all the facts. Right. Don't commit right. to it. <laughs> no, right. but I do see what you're saying. So here's my question. As a society, as parents, as brothers, sisters, cousin, nephew, neighbor, as, as another human being for your neighbors. My question is this. I never took the class in middle school, high school, or university for the short, short period of time that I was there. I never took the class that taught me how to make decisions. Because what you're saying is that you need to make a decision or enable myself to make that decision because I've got to say, okay, the shit that I'm going through, I don't like it. There is a better version of myself here. Mm -hmm. I need to make that decision that I want to go here. Mm -hmm. But that process of making decision making, I don't think we're born with it. I think it's a skill that you learn over a period of time. So mm -hmm. if I have not been able to be given that decisions, or, 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 or I should rephrase, if I have not been able to be guided to how to get to the right decisions, right? How am I supposed to make that decision when I'm 40 years old and depressed? Yeah, that, that's a very valid, valid question. So one of the things I believe that we, there, there's a couple of things that I believe, let's go back to youth and we can talk about that because during that period of time, we are highly influenced. So to answer your question, one, it, it really involves the environment. What I mean by that, if you're not in an environment that does two things, that creates expectations of direction and supports the skill sets to get to that direction, oftentimes a lot of our young people are lost. And so if, if, if you don't have the framework in your youth about decision making, and not only decision making, but consequences of decisions, yes, you can become 20, 30, 40 and not develop because those are skills that are developed. Sometimes people end up finding their path by mishap. Maybe they got divorced, maybe like myself, they were in a domestic violence situation. But I, I think the catalyst to that is that at, and at every different stage of life, we've all been there. Something happens where we say, I'm at a crossroad. I know where I'm at. And that goes back to, this is dissatisfaction. I know where I am at, I am not satisfied. And I believe that that causes one to start thinking, critically thinking, if I don't like where I'm at, then they start asking themselves the how. When we look at the trans theoretical model of change, the first stage is pre-contemplation. In that stage, the person thinks there's no problem, they have no desire to change, um, but then they start to contemplate and they ask themselves, if I left this job, 
And if I went back to school, how much better would my life be? If I got a new location for, I don't know, let's say my business and there was more traffic, something triggers that thought process. That is dissatisfaction. And then I start to look for the solution. Well, maybe I can reach out to this person. Maybe I can reach out to this person. But how do we get people to recognize? To me, you calling it dissatisfaction. I'm having a challenge with it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna. I'm trying to process it myself. I'm trying to look at it in a different angle. I look at it as a self awareness. So let me so ask the you. This. Let me to be aware of where they're at. If they're not aware of where they're at. How are they going to know that where they're going to go? And right. you use a word, word if. That brings in the fear. So yes. contemplating is part of it. But holy shit. You know, yes. when you say change locations, do this, do that, you know, that's scary. You know, see, change. I, I, it is scary. But here's the thing. So when you say self-awareness, when someone becomes uncomfortable with their current situation or dissatisfied, they are aware. I'll give an example. Say, for instance, every day, you sit in that chair and you start to notice your lower back is hurting. At first, you'll just kind of adjust yourself. But let's say you go through day 20 and you say, man, my lower back is hurting. I can't sit like this anymore. Then you start to say, how can I relieve this pain, right? I don't believe that people don't know when they're dissatisfied. I really don't believe that. I believe that internally there is something that sparks and fear prevents us from moving. Fear is a paralyzer. I, I've talked to women who have been at jobs who are highly qualified, who go to work every day, mundane, their minds are totally blank because they're not challenged. They know that they can do more and they recognize that they're not doing enough, but they're afraid. Fear holds a lot of us back from making decisions. There are a lot of people right now that know that they are not satisfied in relationships, but the fear of not finding someone to love them keeps them there. I don't believe that people are not self-aware. I, I find that hard to believe. I, I find it hard to believe that I can walk around with knee pain and not know it's there. The question is, what do I want to do about it? So wouldn't it be uh, wouldn't it be better for us to have um, individuals around us that ask those questions? Because if you want to get a better response, you have to ask better questions. So my question would be, hey, Vahid, you're sitting on that chair. Uh, how's that working out for you? And I'm like, okay. And I'm like, it's okay. You're like, no. How is that working out for you? Okay is not a response. How is that working out for you? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it this? Is it? Are you comfortable? So I think... So how do I get the person that I need next to me to ask me the right questions? Because my chances of beating the disease goes exponentially higher when people ask me the right questions. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm, okay, maybe we need to change the word awareness. Maybe they, they know that they're hurting on their knees. But what if somebody else triggers those thoughts that they were not triggering themselves? I, I think that that's too much responsibility to give to other people. And I'll tell you why. If I came into your office and I saw you sitting in the chair, unless I was doing ergonomics, unless I was coming in to do an adjustment on you as a chiropractor, I would not know to ask you that. And that's what it goes back to self-responsibility and being aware of self. It all starts with self. I can't randomly come to you and say, hey, are you having low back issues? But let's say, for instance, you know a chiropractor friend and you say man my lower back is hurting i'm dissatisfied with this pain and this pain is causing me to have to figure out a solution you may call that chiropractor friend up and say hey so and so i'm having these lower back issues what do you recommend i don't think that it's someone else's responsibility to provide us the solutions we within ourselves have to be able to say this is not what i desire anymore or but your highness how is that working out as a society? But that's the problem. So we must get to the, instead of us trying to shift that focus on someone else's responsibility, we must go back to the narrative that we've created for society. And what I mean by that, I mean, you can look at, um, I have, what, four nieces and two nephews. One of my nephews, I gosh, was very entitled at a certain age. My sister paid for his college, she paid for his vehicle. And he had a really good life until he did not keep up his part of the bargain. 
And I remember telling my sister, he does not keep up his part of the bargain because he has not been required to do so. If you remove the rewards that he has been given, he will then have to step up and take ownership of himself. And I will tell you what he did. He had the, 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 the trinkets and all of the pleasantries of a spoiled child removed. And I'll tell you what he did. He left college, he went and worked for Verizon, and now he's one of the top managers in the region. He got married and he has a son. He had to take responsibility for himself on that path. He had the support of my sister, but she removed I like how you worded, removed the, it, it, it's, it, I would call that punishment, but okay, you call that removing. I, it's well, cool, I, it's I, all I right. I think people are very uncomfortable with accountability. And we have to be honest with that. People are uncomfortable with But as a human being, do we want to be accountable though? Like, is there a gene for it? Like, are we, I feel like, you know, I don't know. I was pretty responsible when I went to school. I did all my homeworks and everything else. But mm -hmm. the question is, how did I get that? You have to answer that for yourself. Did you have an environment that supported that? Or was that an internal drive that drove you to do that? I think I would scare shitless if I don't do it. What would happen? I didn't want to kind of experiment with that. Like right. I, I didn't want to. So it was more, I would say 70, 80%. I would say 90% was fear. Not fear of somebody's going to come beat me up. That wasn't the case. I was just like, I don't want to disappoint them. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Like, what would happen? What would my friends think if I don't get good? You know, all of these different things mm -hmm. that would happen, the consequences of mm -hmm. me not doing it. So and that, that's a good thing. That's a good thing to have consequences. And the consequences do not always have to be negative, right? I don't have to live in a state of fear of everything. But I do know that there is a cause, right? If I go into a store right now and steal, I can guarantee you I will get arrested, right? And if, if, if I were able to go in a store and steal and there were no consequences, I believe more people would steal. And that's what I mean by getting back to the framework as a society, what are the accountabilities of our behaviors? There was a young man, I'll give you an example. I don't know if it was 2016 or 2015, a young man, young Caucasian man, killed four people and injured nine. He was drunk. The judge labeled him as having a term called affluenza. Based on his growing up, he, was, um, he had too much money, too much freedom. I believe it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a poor excuse of not holding someone accountable. He killed four people. I believe he got 572 days in jail for four vehicular homicides. So that's what I mean about accountability. If I do something, there has to be a consequence that's great enough and high enough to make me not do that again. We have to do that with our children. If, if I teach the parents that I work with, if you set boundaries and the children do the very things that you have allotted them not to do that goes into that boundaries, there are consequences, but it, it's required to be consistent with the consequences. We are too free. It's, it's well, I... I make excuses why well, I did it because, okay, that is your reasoning, but these are the consequences. I used to teach, and every morning I had five rules on the wall. Every morning, and I will tell you, every morning, we went over every rule. So the children can never say, well, Miss Jackson, I didn't know. One of the rules was, do not get out of your seat without permission to get up. If they came to my desk without raising their hand, I would say, sir, what is rule number one? Miss Jackson, I'll say, sir, what is rule number one? Do not get out of your seat without raising your hand for permission. I'll say, sir, did you raise your hand? No, ma'am. I'll say, well, please find yourself back at your seat. He'll go back, raise his hand. I'll say, yes, sir, how may I help you? What I was doing was, yeah, I could have answered his question, but that was not the relevance. I needed him to know that there are rules and there are consequences. I went over that every day for the first two months of school. And I'm going to tell you, it created so much order in the learning environment. And it even translated to the way that they behave. Structure, order, and consequences are needed. Are we, are we comfortable with them? Absolutely. How do we do that in the business world where a 1099 entrepreneur and business, are, how are we going to have them raise their hand before they get out of the seat or when to zip up and don't talk when they shouldn't? Like, that's... <laughs> I feel like in the education system, we might have a chance there and we could do it. How do we do that to entrepreneurs? So here, here's the reason.
reality, whether it's in the classroom or whether it's an entrepreneur, skill sets are relevant based on the environment. As an entrepreneur, as a 1099, I've worked for the Navy. I've, I've delivered our workshop as, at Microsoft. When I show up, I am disciplined. If I know that I am supposed to start at 10 a.m., I'm there at 9 o'clock to set up to make sure my handouts are there. I come prepared. We can't make excuses, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's on the director's board. We must show up, and we must show up disciplined, and we must show up with the quality of expectations of ourselves. I am prior military, and I'm going to tell you, you don't just show up to your job in a uniform that's not iron. You don't show up to your job for PT when you decide to. And that is the problem that we have as a society is that we must show up. And if you don't want to show up, don't blame it on me. And that's what I feel a lot of times happens. Well, I, if you say I don't know, I can help you with that. But when you tell me- And you have the same attitude towards the female entrepreneurs or wannabe entrepreneurs that were single or housewives for 20, 30 years, you're going to say they should have took the responsibility for them to be able to, if they're not achieving their goals and they're not satisfied. Like at what point are you going to cut them a break and then from that point on, you're going to hold them responsible. So here's, the, inter know you know. here's the interesting dynamic about that question. In the presence of one does not mean that there's a lack of the other. And I think that that's the part that we struggle with. Because I hold you accountable does not mean that I am not empathetic. It does not mean that I am not your guide and I'm not your support. But if I outline to you and support you, say for instance, you were a stay-at-home mom. That doesn't mean that you have a disease. That doesn't mean you have a handicap. You need the skill sets, you need the competence, and you need the guidance and support. Just because you were a stay-at-home mom does not mean that I'm going to say, hey, well, it's okay to give up on yourself. No, what I am going to say is, based on you being at home for 20 years, what is it now that you feel that you lack that I can help you learn? We have to, I don't believe in making excuses. I believe in addressing the problem understanding why the problem exists, having you understand why the problem exists or helping you to get there and then helping you find a solution. It is not an easy process. Nothing that we want to earn, whether you're an entrepreneur starting from ground up or you were a franchisee, you must work for what you want. And there's no- I was, looking, I was looking for a shortcut. No. <laughs> <laughs> Never has been. <laughs> No, <laughs> no. Damn, you tough, you tough. I don't know. Listen, if anybody's yes. watching this and you're their coach, they need to come to me for fun. <laughs> I'll buy them some ice cream. You know, damn girl, you crazy. Yes. yes. You crazy. Now, I will tell you this. I, I love reading over our reviews and I love reading over the feedback that I get. And one of the most recent feedback that I got from my client was from one of my clients that I was working on with her communication. And she did, she, gosh, she, she leapt mounds and mounds of progress, right? But I'll tell you what, I told her before she came to me, I am going to be honest with you. I am going to be transparent with you and I'm going to support you all the way. And when we did our first session, she said to me, no one's ever challenged me like this. I have a belief, if someone doesn't challenge you, they don't care about you. If someone's content with leaving you the way that you are, they can't care about you. If I'm in your sphere every day and I see certain things, if I care about you, I'll ask you an open-ended question, but my job as person who says they're your friend, they're your colleague, is to challenge you, hey, do you believe that that is your, is your best? I used to tell my students when they turned in their paper and I gave it back to them after grading, They'll say, well, you gave me an F. And I'll say, no, ma'am, you earned an F. You turned in what you wanted to turn in. This is not my responsibility. This is on you. And what I would tell them is, if you choose to do it over, I will give you the opportunity and I will help you if you choose to. Choice. I know. Yeah. I know. It's, and you know, the beautiful thing is, I can only say these things because there are times where I hear myself speaking and I have to get real with myself and say, Letitia, you're making excuses. And it's a very hard thing to hear. And what I'm finding as of lately, whenever <coughs> I procrastinate on something is fear. So I have to confront myself and say, what are you afraid of? 
and be bold enough and brave enough to say, I'm afraid of rejection. I'm afraid of this. I've experienced a lot of racism in the, in the corporate world. There are times where that, that, that fear of, of feeling that again paralyzes me from, I've done stuff at Microsoft, around at military bases. But when I think about going into different corporations, I'm paralyzed by that. What if I experience that racism again? And I have to look at myself and say, Letitia, you okay, are- Okay, Letitia, racism, yes. are you talking about the, the, the color, the age, the being I'm a female, underqualified, what are you talking about? As an African-American woman, I've experienced a lot of racism in a corporate America. And I actually went through some legal things with a company and I, I won the case. So some of that trauma still li lies within my, my mind. And I have to be able to be bold and say to myself, yes, you experienced that. Yes, that feeling of fear is real, but what are you going to do to get yourself from where you're at to where no, you're at? I, I agree with you, that, that's still there. I called my wife, I, you know, everybody knows, I mean, I, I don't look white, I'm Persian, but mm -hmm. I have light color skin, right? I went to Arizona. This was like two years ago, right before my baby was born. I literally called my wife and said, listen, I've never felt like this when I went to supermarket because the way people look at me with the color of my eyes and color of my hair, I am not the norm here. Yes. This is not the norm. And it's not like someone is curious. You got like, you know, Halloween clothes on. They're like, oh, that's cool. It wasn't that kind of look. So I even called my wife and I said, listen, if I stay a little bit longer, you know, I don't put up with this because I never felt it like this in L.A. And I lived here since I was 13. So I never went through that because we got a melting pot over here. It's right. so diverse. Like personally, I never cared who's who, what they do. Everybody minds their own business. As long as you don't mess with me, I don't mess with you. We love right. each other, go do whatever, respect other cultures, religions, even though sometimes I may not agree. I disagree yeah. with a lot of stuff that other people, but that doesn't mean I have to like hate you. No, I just exactly. don't agree with that. I just go do my own thing, right? Exactly. So I felt that. So I don't think, I feel like a lot of people feel it, but they don't talk about it. Yes. I felt it. And the girl who was looking at me sideways, it's an open carry state. She had a big ass, huge, I don't know what kind of a caliber of gun was. I'm not familiar, mm -hmm. but it was long. And right. she had it. So I'm like, okay, do I want to really get into it with this girl? Like, that's not something I want to do. So I mind my own business, but that doesn't mean it didn't affect me. As right. a matter of fact, it did affect me because I'm talking to you about it two years later. That's right. But my wife even knows, I was like, listen, I don't know what's going on over here, but this state don't like people like me. I don't know what's going on. And I did. I was minding my own business at the supermarket, buying my own stuff, minding my own business. Now I walk fast. You know, I might be a little bit, you know, when I move, I'm not quiet. You know, just when you right. go shopping, I'm excited, right? Yeah. So that's how it goes. But I even felt it. Mm -hmm. And it's real. And I, I think the danger, and that's, that's where I go, and I believe that that is why I am so strong on accountability. So often we want to push our behaviors off and not acknowledge them. And that's why even with myself, why I have to at all times check in with me and say, what is your part in this? And to feel that and to be a part of a culture where you do feel the isolation, you do feel the rejection, you do feel the microaggressions. If we're not careful, that builds a, a, a state of fear. You become afraid to go back to the very place that triggered that response. And I think that's what happens with people in life. So many traumas happen and they become stuck where they're at and they're afraid to move forward. And that's where that self-awareness has to happen. And that's why I am as, as, as focused and as intense because had I not believed in myself and that I could get out of the situations I was in, I'd be stuck. And many people find yeah, themselves I, stuck. I agree. But, but listen, to me, it was like, I didn't, I, it wasn't a negative situation for me. It was just an observation. I right. didn't let it stop me. I didn't, you know, I was aware of who I was. And that's where I think I have had the biggest breakthrough of recognizing this, that nobody can bully you if you know who you are. Right. 
Very nobody call, nobody can call you stupid and you take it Thank personal you. if you don't. The only time that that happens is if you don't know who you are. You know? So stay right so there. Call, That's important. You just said um, until you know who you are, if you know who you are. And, and the only person that can define who you are is you, right? And the only Correct. way that you can get to know who you are is to do the work. So irregardless of the outside influences, whether it's social, cultural, individual, that is why I always go back to accountability of self. So if you do the work, and not saying that you don't have outside help, but when you cultivate and curate your definition of self, when you do and when you are put in those positions, even if for half a second you begin to think differently of you, you will always go back to the center of the truth of the knowledge of you. And only you can do that work. Oh, you got to put in the work. No shortcut. I yeah. told you already, no shortcut. I don't no know why shortcut. you keep looking for shortcuts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no, at, that's at the end of the day, it, it all goes back to the original question was, how does it begin? It begins with a desire. You know, I, I knew early on in my life, I wanted to make a difference in the life of women and girls. And now I'm able to use my platform, our workshops, our books, our programs to do that. So everything you so tell us how Yes. So, so tell us, how do people find you? You can find us on Instagram at Empowered Coaching Academy. And you can also go to our website at empoweredcoaching.com. We're on Facebook and we're just now getting on YouTube. You had a question of someone that asked if I was a life coach, and I don't know if you can answer them. I do offer life coaching. So if they're interested, they can email me at empoweredcoaching at gmail.com. Awesome. Yeah, we'll make sure the team puts a link in there so they can find you on Instagram yeah. so they can miss it. Listen, I want to thank you so much Absolutely. for taking this time out of your busy schedule, being with us this morning. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to do more. And if you're ever around LA, Woodland Hills area, let us know. We have a full studio. So we could be authentic and do a real live video with you versus this, what we call yeah. live, <laughs> right? So we could do it in person. It was definitely nice yeah. talking to you. You as well. I love the work you're doing. Thank you. You got it. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.